Um, my first question is for Kale. Um, just entering this season, um, obviously, with Adam Rzichka entering his sophomore season in the AHL, um, how did he... D- how did he play to, you know, uh, correspond to the expectations that you set for him uh, entering this year? Did he sort of meet or surpass your expectations that you might have had for him at the beginning of the year? Well, I'd say that he, he both, you know, met and surpassed the expectations early in the year. I thought that he had an excellent start to his uh, season this year. Obviously, we also the the four multi- or three point games in a row that uh, really vaulted him to the top of the scoring. Um, he was you know, a dominant player in those handful of games. And then if you look at his season as a whole, there were times when he, you know, he had lulls in that. There were times when he had, you know, solid compete, but he didn't have production. So there was a little bit of everything. And that's something that I think with Adam, we've all discussed, you know, openly is that consistency is something that he has to find. So I would say that he, you know, he managed to play up to expectations and beyond, but what he still continues to um, sort of learn and develop toward is that consistency. He's not going to bring that three points a game every night all season long, but he's got to develop toward that consistency on a night in night out basis. And that's somewhere where um, I think that there are some strides made for sure, but he's still got some room to grow. And uh, Adam will agree to that. But I think for his second year here, he took another step. He's certainly a player that looks like he's on a good path. And, you know, would you say that considering everything that you saw from Adam this season, um, would you say that he has developed into a player who you would be comfortable calling, uh, you know, a player who is a number one caliber center in the AHL level at this point? Yes. Yeah. He, you know, I think that he's going to have to, Uh, earn that moniker as you know as we discussed by being consistent but he's definitely got the ability he's got the strength he's got the uh, hockey sense to be that in the AHL he's a he's a high level player and like many players in his situation the you know that have a lot of skill a lot of size good combination that way they have to learn uh, that final piece of being able to bring it every night and, and find ways to contribute so that your your B game is still a really solid game, and so while I, I say that, I still you know have challenged Adam, and and we all do that. He's got to in order to be a number one center every night. He's got to bring it. We'll go ahead over to Ryan. Hey everybody, uh, this question is Ryan. Um, obviously, you know, the NHL season over, the NHL club is still uh, operating. Uh, do you do you know uh, how many players, and if so, which ones will be uh, sticking around from the Stockton group as sort of black aces? Hey, Ryan. Um, yeah, right now it's it's a little bit like this whole season. It's a little bit of an odd circumstance. The the Stockton season, as you know, is is finished for games played when we've played thirty games. The American Hockey League season as a whole goes until May sixteenth. So we have a number of players that have, have continued to stay around. Um, for lack of better terms, they're still getting paid. They're still on their AHL pay period until the 16th. So we have a number of players that are still sticking around and, um, you know, as AHL Stockton players, they, I wouldn't consider them black aces at this point or taxi squad. They're, they're in, a, in a separate group and continue to skate and, you know, for, you know, I think, I guess from a development standpoint, continue to develop here for the next week or two. And then, you know, from the NHL standpoint, we'll make a determination if, uh, if any of those guys would, would make a jump potentially or potentially not. And I guess a quick follow-up for you. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the Heat had a lot of guys on sort of AHL or uh, AHL two-way contracts this year who made significant contributions. Uh, are you able to sort of uh, speak to any of them that stood out uh, to you? And uh, are there any chances of uh, you guys announcing any NHL deals for AHL players in the near future? Yeah, sure. You know, for us, every year, Ryan, you, you look and your, your primary focus in the American League is your young your young NHL contract players uh, and you're there to develop them and get them playing time and what have you. And and you supplement your team with um, either other NHL contract players, some veteran players and some American league contracts, both from a depth standpoint, players that might end up playing some time in Kansas city or, or what have you. 
And uh, this year, although it's a little bit different, we had more players sticking around than we did just with the border closed. Um, you know, I, th I think a number of them, we had some young defensemen that we signed that we wanted to get in some games uh, to have a look at. I thought, you know, they showed well. A lot of it was in practice. And then up front, you know, Mark Simpson was a player that I thought had good size, good reach, uh, started out really well, a little bit of an older player from UNB. Um, you know, I, I like some of the U-sport guys. I think they, have, they play a little bit more of a mature game and and uh, you know we've we've gone down that path as an organization and and with Stockton the last few years and and seem to find find some good players. But I, I mean I could go through the whole roster with you. We have some older guys in the way of uh, Alex Gallant and, and Zach Leslie that you know provided really strong leadership and and uh, you know solid role players in in, in what they can do. But uh, you know overall I think some of those guys showed well and uh, and some got more opportunity than they. Than, than others, and unfortunately, I wish I wish we could have seen some more of them, some of the younger defensemen, especially in the lineup. But playing 30 games makes it a little bit difficult. And uh, I guess one last one for me, just a quick one. Uh, do you guys are you able to uh, have you finalized the plans for the AHL club for next year in terms of where it'll be, it'll be playing, whether it be Stockton or here again? Yeah, we're just in the in the final stages of going through things. We have a AHL board meeting coming up at the end of this week, which I think we'll get a little bit more guidance on. Uh, I think initially, as we as we said all along, our, our intention is to uh, be back in Stockton, and we're just working on you know working on some details to uh, to be in a in a situation a situation where we can I guess publicly say that, uh, but by saying it now is no different than what we said you know in the past when we when we made a temporary relocation here is our intention is to be back in Stockton next year, and that hasn't changed at all to be honest, with you, Ryan. So. I, no, no real news to report other than we're just working on finalizing the, the fine details of that and, and ensuring. But it, as I said all along, it's been our intention to, to go back there. And that's, if you're asking me, that's a plan. That's a plan now. And we hope to have things finalized soon. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead over to Darren. Brad, this is for you. Any, um, maybe this is too early to ask, but, uh, you know, typically a summer in Calgary, means the stampede and development camp <laughs> not yes. necessarily in that order um any idea whether some of that normalcy from a development perspective for the team can come back this summer or too soon to tell uh i hope so is is the answer and i think uh well i know i don't think i know that the the nhl as a whole is is this is an agenda item for them to figure out not just for the for for the calgary flames but for every team as a whole and putting that as part of the calendar of, you know, our teams allowed to have development camps. What are the restrictions around that? And what, you know, most importantly for us, what are the dates that that we'd be allowed to do that? And um, so the the uh, to answer the question is our our hope is um, I would assume it would be in around after the draft if they do allow it, uh, but nothing nothing finalized by the league yet. Right. Okay. The question for Kale: What uh, you know, looking back on this season, what's the what's the challenge that maybe stands out in hindsight that you hope you're kind of done with and normalcy returns in the fall? You know, I, I think I have a whole new respect for the lack of practice time that NHL teams, coaches, players deal with because that was a real challenge when you look at the complete schedule for us. Uh, I look at how we started based on the amount of time we had to prepare and how our first um, uh, couple weekends went. Feel real good about that. And then you look at the way the season uh, sort of carried on and the practice got really comp compressed or absent and how that affects a young group of players and a developing group of players. You realize just how precious that time is. And even from the player's perspective, I think they realize it too. So I think that's a great lesson in all of this for for us, um, you know, just the, the newfound respect of the repetition of practice, the teaching, the uh, detail that then carries forward into your game. You know, I now really understand when uh, an NHL team says, oh, we had, a, we had a day to practice or two days to practice, we should be really good. And now I, I really get that more so than I did being in a development situation in Stockton where we had, you know, two, three, four practices a week. 
Yeah, it is a good point. I never really thought of that. You mentioned it because, you know, even even here at the NHL level, they, they yeah, they really cherish and Daryl Sutter cherishes that practice time. And, mm-hmm. and but but it's one thing when you have guys in their mid 20s, late 20s, early 30s, it's all kind of you, you, you know, it's not they're not in the same situations. Your guys where you're trying to really it's a fire hose of information you're packing into your time then. Yeah, it's definitely when you think of the young, especially the first and second year players who haven't been, you know, um, you know, systematically, they don't have the discipline in their game naturally coming from lower levels where they played, you know, uh, real dominant roles, maybe had the opportunity to do some things that you wouldn't be able to do at the pro level in terms of their the detail in their game. You're trying to bring those guys into a fold and have everyone have some real good adherence to what we want to do as a group, whether it's, you know, face off um, responsibilities, whether it's small things like, you know, having your stick on a puck or skating in someone's way to help your D man buy some time on a breakout. Those are things that usually come through a lot of repetition. And for a first year guy to grasp that uh, one of our players made the point, you know, we're 20, 25 games in and they said, Hey, if this were a regular season, you'd just be hoping guys are starting to like really pick these things up. So it's, it's something that um, at our level, it, it counts for a lot in drilling these things in. And so uh, it's something that, you know, we'll really appreciate when we get some more practice time, tried to make the best of the time we had. And I thought we did have some good time and some good practices, but it'll be nice to be able to get back to that schedule where you've got a little more emphasis on it for the, for a young developing team. Yeah. Thanks, Gil. Thanks, Brad. Go to Patrick. First, uh, first question is for Kale. Uh, what do you think your players are going to take away from the season? Maybe looking back in a year or two, what lessons may help them further on in their careers? Well, I think uh, obviously, I think that was one of them. The idea that just the respect for, you know, what practice does for you as a player. Um, I think that they'll, they'll appreciate that those details when they're, when they get loose, you know, you can have trouble as a team. And so that's going to make them a better pro player, just having the respect for that element of the game. Um, I I think another uh, takeaway that they will have is what it's like on your body and your mind to deal with this kind of a uh, schedule and situation. Because as we, you know, we're all reading and learning, the idea of, you know, nutrition and sleep are becoming, you know, so um, prominent, but also, the idea of your ability to sort of neurologically disconnect and manage how you're going about your day to day so that you're really on point in a game to make good decisions, to be clear of mind and be quick of mind. And that can be interfered with when you're playing all the time. And when your other alternative is to be at home, most likely on a screen or watching TV because of COVID. So I think guys are, uh, have sort of learned something through this, that, you know, that's the next wave of what we're going to need to really take care of, really be mindful of, is how we handle our mental aspect of our game. I'm not talking, you know, straight mental health. I'm talking like your daily habits and just sort of how you, how you sleep and how you prepare and how you deal with that downtime. So I think this is a good, uh, a good taste of being super uh, compacted in schedule which they'll be able to sort of uh, remember, use the habits that they developed or things they learned because they are, when you get into the NHL, as you know, Patrick, it's, it's not that far off, right? Playing as often as we did. Uh, and then for Brad, uh, where do you expect the player free agent market to be this summer at the kind of the NHL, AHL level, those guys are in between. Um, it was a really tough market this past off season. Yeah. Good question, Patrick, in the way of, from a monetary standpoint, I guess my opinion would be, um, you know, in a, in a coming off of a season with with no or limited revenue for a number of teams, I think that, uh, quite honestly, I think you know teams and organizations are going to be looking of where they spend their money and spend their money wisely. Uh, so that I think would be a factor, perhaps maybe not for all, but for most teams in the way of. Uh, you know, dollars and cents. And, you know, and I'm looking, trying to crystal ball it a little bit. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, with, with Seattle coming in, um, you know, that means more jobs. So you'd think that both on the NHL side and the HL side, we're creating more jobs by 
by that. And I think that's an advantageous thing for the players is potentially more opportunity to shine. So um, it's hard to really determine what it is, but I guess those would be my, my two cents. If I was a player, I would be um, knowing that there's some opportunities for a few more seats around the campfire, if you will. And, you know, but secondly, I think that you have to keep the monetary, uh, you know, pool of, of money available, perhaps in, in mind. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Paige. Hi, Brad. Um, just a question about kind of the regular communication between the other teams in this organization here. Um, did you feel like the communication between the Mavericks and Flames differed at all this year or was pretty much the same as previous seasons? Um, I would say it would be different and different in the way that we didn't have as many transactions back and forth uh, with us in Kansas City. And, you know, the number one reason is just is the, the quarantine related to the border. So, in a normal in a normal year, if you have a player that perhaps maybe he's on a miracle league contract, maybe he's a first or second year player that has sat out, hasn't played for whatever reason due to numbers, call, send downs, or what have you, you know, you might send that player to Kansas City to play three, five, eight games, then bring him right back up. Um, and I think with the the border the way it was, we didn't we didn't really have that opportunity per se. So, uh, so. I think the, well, I know the communication with us at Kansas City is strong. Uh, we have a really good relationship. Uh, they have great people there. And I think they've made some really good strides here this past season. Um, and, and we love the relationship with them. Uh, we would talk to them on a regular basis, but quite honestly, just because of the limited transactions we had is not as much as in a regular year. For sure. Um, and then just overall with the whole COVID situation, how did you guys feel like it was managed in this division this year, especially kind of with the way COVID is out in Alberta and also with what it happened with the Vancouver Canucks as well? Yeah, I can tell you our, our dealings with our medical group and with Alberta Health Services and just to have the ability to um, and the approval to, to play in Alberta and play in this division was you know, we were very privileged to, to do that, knowing that all the hoops that everyone has to jump through. And um, I think for us, I, I don't want to say it was easy because that's that's the wrong word, but because we follow the NHL protocols to a T, the similar to what, you know, obviously what the NHL teams are doing, um, it made it more seamless for us to, to operate within the division uh, daily testing, strict protocols on what we, where we could walk and what we had to do and limited interactions. And um, it, it, it made for a challenging, exciting and memorable year in a lot of ways, you know? And, you know, I think just to piggyback on what Kale said is what, what are some of the players remember? I mean, as we all know, we all live, we all live day to day here. It's, it's, it's everything, every day is different, but, you know, for a player, you know, you don't have all players in one dress room. You're spread amongst different dressing rooms. You're getting tested every day. You're, you know, on the road, you have an individual room. You don't have a roommate. You, you know, your interactions with your teammates are, are limited and on Zoom and what have you. So, you know, it, it, lots of memorable things that are different than anything else that we've been involved with hockey or life in general, but specifically the day-to-day -day operations of the Stockton Heat it was a different year. Definitely. Um, thanks, Brad. I just have one more question for Kale. Um, just kind of from a team's perspective, did you sense any dis disconnect or disappointment when you guys found out that playoffs were out of the picture? You know, I think that uh, playoffs were, were always, the guys were always very skeptical of playoffs. So I think that the, the entire season they're with that skepticism I think that can sort of eat away a little bit at uh, the back of the player and coach's mind, you know, being honest, we all, we're all sort of built to, you know, work for the postseason, and that's where our, um, you know, sort of focus lies. So with that skepticism comes a little bit of a, I wouldn't say disconnect, but a little bit of question, uh, obviously. And I think as time wore on and it looked like it might be more and more evident, I also feel as if players, you know, might have a little harder time with their motivation, just sign of the times as well. That's sort of the, the deal without uh, a definite goal at the end of the uh, season in terms of playoffs. I think it, that can have a bit of an effect on 
a player's motivation being a professional athlete. So was it uh, a definite, you know, point where we suddenly, you know, felt that and took a turn for the worse? No, I don't think that at all. I think some of our issues later in the season were a culmination of things. And, uh, but there was an overall feeling that it was a, a disappointing not to have playoffs, but also I just want to say, I think the players would agree with me that we're pretty grateful that we had 30 games period. That's something that a lot of people went to great lengths for and a lot of other hockey players and people have a lot of situations that where they just, you know, weren't nearly as fortunate as we were to be able to play. Thank you. Thanks. Go back to Mike. Okay. Um, so this question's for Brad. Um, so looking at, looking at Matthew Phillips. Um, so after the season that he had uh, being, you know, on the first line with Adam Rzichka for most of the year um, and putting up the production that he put up, what do you see with Phillips in terms of his place in the organization at this point? Matt's an exciting player, uh, continues to be um, a player that, that provides production. He's a competitive player uh, that is always in a battle. And I think this year, um, he, his, his game, every time he seemed to get on the ice, he has that level of creativity where he can make offensive plays happen. He possesses the puck extremely well and can make plays. There was a reason that this player was, was named as an AHL All-Star last year. Um, for where he sits uh, in the organization, um, you know, he had a call up last year, wasn't called up yet this year. Um, you know, we understand this player is, uh, is smart, competitive, and skilled, and a player that, that we continue to like and uh, continue to work together in, in developing him to, uh, to hopefully one day be a full-time NHL player. And obviously this season is, you know, different than most because there's the potential at the end of the year for you to lose any player to Seattle uh, who's not on your protection list. Mm -hmm. um, and unlike... Uh, you know, unlike most of your prospects who are playing down there, Phillips is a guy who is eligible uh, to be selected. And I was just wondering, you know, how concerning is that to you? And, you know, what, what level of consideration do you have when you look at Phillips going forward, thinking of Seattle in mind? Well, I, I can tell you just for, for him and Seattle, that, that, that hasn't really you know, been something that I've spent a lot of time or considered. I, I can tell you just organizationally, I mean, the rules are the rules. There's the ex expansion rules and this, these are the players, you know, that that are will be eligible and, you know, this is the player that you're going to lose and, and what have you. So we're all in the same boat. So I'm not, you know, I think that it, to say it is what it is, but that's, uh, you know, those are the rules in front of us. Um, as an organization, from a hockey operation standpoint, we sit down on a regular basis and go through our lists and 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 what other teams are looking at, what Seattle's looking at, and you know this year is no different. And we're going to continue to do that between now and you know the morning before we have to uh, to submit our our list into the into the league. So, not much to report other than hey, it's it's uh, it's a topic of discussion has been continues to be and uh, will be right till the end. And the last one for me um, would be. You know, obviously with the season drawing to its end and, um, you know, the, the playoff chances are, are getting a little bit, bit fade, uh, you know, it's they're fading a little bit, you know, just, just at this point. What is the appetite like in the organization to give Matt Phillips, you know, a look in the NHL at some point this season? Well, yeah, this, I mean, this season here, I think that's going to be just an ongoing, dis ongoing discussion. You're right. Our focus is, is to win games and, and if we feel the players can help us win games, that's what we do. And that's, that's our mantra going forward. So if that, it comes a time where there's players deserving um, to have a look, you know, we'll evaluate that as a, as a group. All right. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Ryan. This is another one for Brad. Uh, I guess a uh, two part, I guess first part, uh, obviously a strange year uh, with the, the junior leagues getting going uh, significantly later than they usually do. You actually yeah. got a chance to sort of see Connor Zary and Dustin Wolf play professional games as teenagers. Um, I guess, what was your, what were your takeaways from the time they had with the, the heat? And I guess, uh, what do you think the value is, uh, you know, for, for their development having gotten those games in? Yeah, th them specifically, you're right. They, it, they were, uh, I mean, 
Dustin was here a shorter period of time um, just based on his startup, but hey, they, he, he, this, this is a player that we like a lot. Uh, he was impactful. He had the, uh, the, his first game was a tough start, but then after that, he really settled in and played well. And, and we were excited to have the opportunity to have him. I think, and Connor, the same thing. I, I think you look at, at what Connor did and the situations that Kale and the staff put him in and in, in offensive zone situations and, and playing with Rizitska and Phillips and, and in different situations. I mean, he excelled in that area. And, you know, we picked him in the first round for a reason. Um, in saying that, I think, yeah, I think they gained valuable experience. As, as you mentioned, it's it's a unique year, Ryan, of where we had the ability to, to try them in those roles where normally you wouldn't. Um, and I think with there being a taxi squad, you know, you have you have roles to fill. Uh, those players that normally on the taxi squad they'd be in the American League, and then you add these guys, then perhaps there's a little bit of a log jam, uh, not only our team but every other team. So it it's it was unique in a number of of ways, but I think it was positive as well. I think my feeling is anytime you can have your players, um, you know, under your umbrella and working with your coaching staff and and working with your off ice conditioning and and what have you. Um, under your umbrella, you, you're excited about that. You feel that you're impacting the player, and not that they aren't getting that same quality of uh, of attention in their junior team or their college team. It's uh, you know, I think it's just a human nature thing that if you see the person every day, you feel better than if you see the person online watching games. So, um, so that I think that was an exciting part of just really you know, putting them under our wing, both of those players and, and, uh, and, and we felt that they developed for the time they were here. And uh, I guess sort of jumping off that, obviously, you know, the, no one really knew what was happening with the Ontario Hockey League for pretty much the entire season. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously had Rory Karen's uh, sort of in-house this year. He didn't play a ton, but for, for a guy his age to even play at all in the American League, it's pretty remarkable. For, from his, for him specifically, you know, how do you guys make sure that, you know, even though he doesn't get a lot of games and that this is a, a valuable learning year for him? Because, you know, obviously for a lot of players, that, that draft plus one season is huge for their development. Yeah, we talked a lot to to Rory before you know before he came in, and then while he was here, and and the understanding was, hey, you're coming here for an experience. You're coming here uh, rather than working out at home in 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 a restricted environment in um, in Ontario, but you know just overall in COVID, um, you know he was excited about the opportunity, whether he was going to play every game or play no games or play a handful of games. The goal for him was to come, obviously impress. But to just work on his game in you know day in and day out, that was the that was the goal that he had. That was the goal that we had. And back to my previous answer of just having having him day in and day out. But I mean, this is a player that um, has a tremendous shot. He's obviously an offensive player, and you know I think if the Ontario League got back and running, or definitely next year, you know this player is is an offensive minded player that's gonna that's gonna have good production numbers and. And that's what we saw on him, especially in practice. You're right; he had, had a handful of games, and um, but I think, well, I know that uh, during the time he was here, he made some positive, positive steps in his overall development, and that was the goal, and that's why we had him here. Thank you. All right, guys, we're starting to get a little low on time, so just if you have any more questions you want to ask, please raise your hand now. We'll try to get to everybody. Um, I'll just give you guys a second to do that. Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this one's for Brad. Uh, Brad, what do you see as uh, some of the bigger challenges uh, for the American Hockey League coming in next season uh, off of this year? Well, I think the goal of everybody, first and foremost, is, is to be back on a regular calendar, regular schedule, um, regular travel. Uh, what are the challenges I foresee for American Hockey League being a Canadian team is is the dealing with the unknown. and. Mm -hmm you know, for like, what, what will be the border? Uh, what will be, you know, the ability to, to have players cross the border and, and quarantine requirements and what have you. Uh, every, you know, every province, every state seems to be uh, a little bit different in, in where they're at and when they're opening up in the US and, and versus what's happening in Canada. So it's probably the biggest challenge for the American League as a whole, including, I guess, all, all the Canadian teams is just the unknowns of of the effects of COVID come September, October. 
I could tell you collectively a goal as a, as an organization and as a as a league, we're looking to uh, to get back to normal as best as we can. Um, and in, with that being said, in a safe environment. So that's that's what the be all end all goal. And then just to follow on that, uh, if the border was to stay kind of like it is now, mm-hmm. how much of an obstacle does that become next season for all, not just for you but any Canadian team? Yeah, I, you know, probably something I don't want to comment too, too much on because it's just, it's a hypothetical. I think we would deal with that at the time. I think our, our planning and our goal is that, um, that that won't be an issue. So, and if it becomes an issue, no different than it did this year, we would, you know, we would deal with it as an organization and then collectively as a league. Great. Thank you. Got time for maybe two more if anyone wants them. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, um, just last one for me, and I guess I'll go right back to Brad. Um, obviously, this is the end of uh, Luke Phillips' two-year deal uh, with you guys that he signed uh, at the end of the 2019 season. And um, what have you seen from him over the last two years that might make you inclined to potentially continue that relationship going forward? Yeah, two, well, two parts. I'll talk to Luke, and then I'll talk just about RFAs in general. But um you know, I, if you look at our team and our players, Luke was, was one of our most consistent, if not the most consistent player throughout the season with his, with his play. Um, he's tenacious on pucks. He can competes, he battles and he brings offensive oppor- opportunity to his, to his overall game. Um, in respect to his contract status, him, and we have a number of players that are RFAs, uh, including Luke. Um, as an organization, we sit down and and throughout the season, we make we have those discussions, but ultimately we have some time here. Um, you know, he's owned by us as an RFA. Uh, we'll go through our whole our plans and our contract situations for every player, including Luke, and then make those determinations going forward here in the in the coming weeks. And and I know it, it, when it comes to uh, to the deadline, obviously prior to the deadline. Right, and I'll I'll throw Kale a bone uh, just to finish this off for me. Um, just going off that same topic, um, what does Luke offer to your lineup in terms of his versatility? Well, I think obviously both special teams, right? Prominent role on both sides. Uh, the PK has come along this year. We've given him more of an opportunity knowing that Luke's quick. He's got a good brain and um, he caught on. I thought he did very well in that uh, respect. He's versatile, not just, you know, across situations, but even within situations. We've used him on the half wall on the power play, but he's really good in the bumper position on the power play. So it gives you good options there because, you know, not everyone can move to the inside and have a real effect on the overall play, like a, like a Bergeron would in Boston. So really appreciate that element of uh, Luke to be able to move him in between there. And then the other side of it is five on five, you know, helping him develop a bit as a center this year as well as a winger. I feel we can play him on both wings and in the middle. So you've got uh, a young man who's, you know, finishing his second year consistent uh, across the board, as Brad had mentioned, just in terms of his work ethic is great. He produces offensively. Uh, even in a maybe you might call it a bit of an off year, he's still quite solid uh, for an off year that way and certainly is able to be used across all situations. So brings a lot to the table for us. So, you know, really appreciate his compete and the fact that uh, you can count on him in, in, to be an impact on the game every night. All right. Thank you both. Got time for one more if anyone wants it. No takers. I'll, I'll take, I'll, I, I can ask, I can ask Brad one more. Yeah. Um, you know, goaltending this year was, was, you know, strange, you know, you had a lot of guys cycling through um, and the guy who I just specifically want to uh, mention just you know, last is, is Tyler Parsons who, um, you know, missed most of the year and then got back for one game before the end. And then he got sick, you know, just, you know, a, a difficult season. And he's another one of your RFAs. And at this juncture, you know, where does the organization see Tyler Parsons? Well, we were excited for Tyler to get healthy. He had ankle surgery, came back, worked really hard to rehab, had to come in, quarantine 14 days, and then get back on the ice. So there's a lot of challenges. Uh, played some games at the end. Um, would have played some more, had actually got food poisoning for a few days there, and uh, would have played some more games towards the end. But uh, um, he's, he's completely healthy. He's ready to go, continues to be a prospect. As you mentioned, he's an RFA. 
Uh, he, I would clump him together with all the other RFAs. That's a discussion we'll have organizationally as we uh, move forward. But obviously, a player that we that we continue to like, and it's had some hiccups along the road here with injuries. But knowing that he's 100% healthy is a positive thing. All right, thank you, Brad.